Georgia's DBHDD is urging people to store and lock away all medications to prevent theft and keep them away from children and pets. Old medications can be disposed at Dropbox locations. Dropbox locations can be found at opioidresponse.info. Hello and welcome to the Georgia Today podcast from GPB News. Today is Friday, July 28th. I'm Orlando Montoya. On today's episode, the city of Macon looks to increase neighborhood safety with a project spearheaded by young people. Georgia ranks among the top states for economic development for clean energy. And a look at how the summer heat will affect young athletes as they head back to the practice field. These stories and more are coming up on this edition of Georgia Today. Many people are looking for ways to slow the pace of violence in their communities. In Macon, a project that started this summer is looking at improving the physical appearance of seniors' homes. There, young people in the community make repairs, reducing the gap of misunderstanding between two generations and hopefully making life safer for the people most likely to be the victims of violence, the young people themselves. GPB's Eliza Moore has the story. It's a rainy day in the historic Pleasant Hill neighborhood, and Sherman Kind is showing me around the area he's loved since he was a kid. Oh, this is beautiful. Pleasant Hill was founded by black professionals after the Civil War, who couldn't get housing in other areas of the community. The neighborhood thrived until Interstate 75 was built through its heart. This brought blight that Kind says has changed the landscape. Just imagine every house you see is abandoned and just ragged in. What kind of sense of community where that gives you. It, it'll make you feel like your community was worthless. So why would you care about anything worthless? It just it don't matter. That's why Kind is helping to do repairs on senior homes. He points to a yellow house almost invisible behind the tree line. It looked like nobody lived in the house. It turns out someone does. Amanda White has lived in Pleasant Hill her whole life. She tells me her brother lives in that house. But he's a veteran and he's um, had three strokes, but he don't hardly get around, but, but he still lives there, but the house about to fall in. Amanda's brother is one of many senior residents whose homes will receive renovations this year. What the um, United Way is doing for the elderly, I think that's, that's good because a lot of elder people don't feel comfortable anymore even living in the neighborhood. They just stay shut up in their houses and stuff. The project repairing her brother's home and where Sherman Kind is working is called Safe by Design. The idea behind the grant-funded program is that, by physically repairing the neighborhood, it will be less susceptible to crime and violence, an urban planning strategy called crime prevention through environmental design. For the first phase in June, United Way of Central Georgia brought in volunteers like Frank Dixon to conduct safety surveys of the neighborhood. Dixon works with Sherman Kind in another program, Cure Violence Macon, a nonprofit working to decrease gun violence. He says Safe by Design will install floodlights on each side, the the doorbell, um, and the peephole, and the reflective lighting. Those four things will make a house safer. For the second phase of the project, Dixon has enlisted a group of local boys in their early teens that he mentors to help fix up the seniors' houses. They're excited to help their neighborhood. Like Naeem Moore, they've grown up here. What I, what I love about my neighborhood is it's at peace to me. It really at peace, good environment. In the city where homicides average around one a week, oftentimes those who are killed are only a few years older than these boys. Dixon wants to change this. He says change can happen when the boys learn to care for their community through relationships with their elders. And then those relationships make seniors less afraid of young people. And hopefully these kids become adopted grandkids to these elderly, and, and, and these relationships go past just the initial work. You know, it doesn't, you know it's not rocket science. It's like we just re, reestablishing our culture as a, as a vibrant, historic community. And I think if they see this as sacred ground. If not sacred, at least a place they want to protect. United Way plans to expand the project to other neighborhoods in Macon in the coming months. For GPB News, I'm Eliza Moore in Macon. Georgia's DBHDD has an urgent health warning. One of every 10 counterfeit pills contain fentanyl, a powerful and very deadly drug. Pills from friends or dealers are unsafe, and one pill can cause an overdose. More info at opioidresponse.info. 
One of the two medical cannabis manufacturing companies that so far have been awarded licenses to operate in Georgia has opened its first dispensary. Botanical Sciences held dedication ceremony for the facility in Pooler near Savannah on Wednesday. The company began growing marijuana and converting the crop into low THC oil at a plant in Glenville earlier this year. State lawmakers passed a law in 2019 to legalize medical marijuana under close supervision to treat various ailments. Georgia ranks among the top states for economic development around clean energy. That's according to a new report by an advocacy group for green power. GPB's Benjamin Payne reports. 22 clean energy projects were announced in Georgia within the last year, second only to Michigan. So says the group Climate Power, which analyzed data ahead of the one-year anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act. Savannah Mayor Van Johnson is applauding that bill as a game-changer for clean energy investment in southeast Georgia, where Hyundai plans to use the law's tax credits at a future EV plant in Bryan County. The Inflation Reduction Act is uplifting the middle class here in Georgia. We can't be the best place in the country in which to do business, as our governor often likes to say, uh, but at the end of the day, not be the place that is harnessing the green energy opportunities that that provides. Georgia also ranked second highest in the number of new clean energy jobs at over 16,000. For GPB News, I'm Benjamin Payne. An Arizona man has been sentenced to nearly three years in prison for recruiting a former friend to claim falsely that he witnessed a sexual assault by a former Georgia Tech basketball coach. Ronald Bell pleaded guilty in the case earlier this year. He and two others conspired falsely to accuse the coach and demand money from Georgia Tech in exchange for not reporting the fictional assault. With Georgia students heading back to the classroom in these summer weeks, many also will head outside to practice sports, with summer heat posing a serious risk. Georgia high school coaches are well aware that no one, not even young and seemingly healthy athletes, is immune from extreme temperatures. John Nelson of GPB Sports tells us how these coaches and administrators are working to keep students safe. Around the state, outdoor treatments vary from start times in the early morning to early evening. But the key, according to GMC prep head coach Bobby Rhodes, in a city like Milledgeville, is knowing your student athletes. It's something we take very seriously. Um, we, we stay on top of it. That's one of the main things I monitor throughout the course of a practice is looking for signs of heat-related illnesses so we can act on it really quickly. Several school systems around the state have gone to the lengths of building indoor training facilities. One of those is at Lowndes High in Valdosta. Athletic director Danny Redshaw says it was built for more than just football in mind. Now, you know, football (laughs) does use it, and there is a football field there, but uh, it is school-wide as far as uh, the availability of that thing to use, and it is, we are very fortunate to have it. Director for the 400-plus member Georgia Bridgman Band, John Bowman, is thankful his team has a base of operations to train as well. We're in camp right now since last week. We were able to go in there at 1 o'clock. I mean, you know, we're normally inside during that time of the day, you know, getting stuff done, but we were able to go in there and work out some problems and just to be able to still get rehearsals in when, when, when the weather sets in. Let the games begin as all the schools around the state try to hit the right notes in 2023. John Nelson, GPB News. Bronny James, the eldest son of NBA all-time great LeBron James, suffered a cardiac arrest on Monday while working out with his new teammates at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And earlier this year here in Georgia, a Mercer soccer player died from cardiac arrest while playing a pickup game. The condition is not unheard of. In fact, it's the leading cause of death in young athletes. Dr. Michael Ackerman with the Mayo Clinic joins me now to talk about cardiac arrest as student athletes return to practice all over Georgia. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Ackerman. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. When we think about student athletes and athletes in general, we are thinking about people at the top of their physical game. So how do these players suffer from cardiac arrest? Well, I think uh, it's important that it's not just athletes. It's really if you are alive and healthy, all of us, have a chance of experiencing sudden cardiac arrest. So there's this background low, low chance. And, but we know that in college and in certain sports and in certain types of athletes, men versus women, white versus black, the numbers are not the same for everybody. 
So it may be one in 80,000 for all athletes and probably all humans who are on college campuses, but it can get as high as one in 4,000, one in 5,000 chance per year if you are a black male playing Division I university basketball. So it's not a one-size-fits-all risk, uh, and it's not just the athlete. What are the warning signs of cardiac arrest? Well, sudden cardiac arrest, or SCA by definition, is a near instantaneous faint, followed by not waking up on your own within 10 seconds, meaning you faint, you suddenly collapse, you're not waking up, you now need activation of the emergency action plan, call 911, push chest compressions fast, and get that external defibrillator, apply it and deliver the shock if instructed to do so. That's sudden cardiac arrest. And in many people, there are no warning signs for that particular moment in which the collapse happens. Now, there could be a warning sign that might have happened in that person two years ago. They might have had an exercise triggered faint and they woke up 10 seconds later on their own. So, and if that went unrecognized and unevaluated, then the next episode may be far more dramatic than just a self-limiting faint. So somebody who's had a sudden, out of the blue, exercise triggered faint, that's not just a warning sign of a faint, that's a warning sign for the possible future sudden cardiac arrest. What can schools and coaches do to increase safety to make it safer for student athletes? Oh, I think uh, it really starts with awareness and readiness. You know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. And so you're starting to see what I call sudden death safety nets being set up everywhere. So if you don't know of an athlete or an artist or an academic health status because they've had no warning signs and maybe a screening program would or would not detect them, then what you want to do is that if anybody collapses on campus, whether it's the student athlete, the academic student, or the custodian, that whoever collapses, wherever they collapse, there would be an emergency action plan readied and activated and rehearsed. Those programs that have it in place, casinos do an amazing job. It's hard to die suddenly in casinos because they have an action plan, no matter how much money you lose. It's hard to die suddenly in an airplane or an airport because they have the AED plan uh, readied and in place. So having, making it hard to die suddenly in your community, in the public square, is one of our best strategies for the unknown event. The other is finding those who are at risk, getting them treated effectively so that that safety plan will never need to be executed for that person because you know about them. Are we seeing an increase in cardiac events for kids? And what, if any, role does COVID-19 or long COVID play? Yeah, great question. Uh, You know, the COVID and the vaccine for COVID is being linked to everything. And I think this has been utterly irresponsible with respect to young people dying suddenly as if they're dropping like flies left and right because of the jab. It's absolute nonsense. It's actually quite cruel from my standpoint for that messaging uh, because in our program at Mayo Clinic, I've been taking care of sudden cardiac arrest survivors for decades now, long before this thing called SARS-CoV-2 even existed and long before there was thing called the vaccine for it. and In those who are genetically predilected, there should have been more episodes happening left and right because my patients are already primed for uh, an electrical episode. And yet we saw absolutely zero, zero increase in events in the three years of the epidemic pandemic uh, and in the three years before it. No difference. So you know, the virus and the vaccine might get credit or blame for some things, but it deserves neither credit or blame for these sudden cardiac arrests from my vantage point. And before I let you go, just to change the subject a little bit to heat stroke, I know a lot of parents and coaches are concerned about that. What are some warning signs that people should be looking for on heat stroke? 
all healthy people should be staying well hydrated if they're out on 80 degree, 90 degree, 100 degree days. All healthy people should be doing 80 to 120 ounces, uh, if possible, of non-caffeinated, non-alcoholic beverages like water. Important in the summer two-a-day football two-a-days that will start happening in uh, Southeast United States and other places. It's just really important to stay hydrated. But people shouldn't be scared that the heat is going to trigger a sudden cardiac arrest. That's incredibly rare. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Ackerman. Great to be with you, and thanks for doing this. Georgia's Attorney General has signed off on a planned partnership between Wellstar and Augusta University Health Systems. A report released yesterday by the Office of Attorney General Chris Carr is a key step in a merger announced last year. The partnership will expand the university's health sciences training and research across the state and commits Wellstar to nearly $800 million in capital projects over the next decade. Some state lawmakers have questioned the plan after Wellstar closed two hospitals in the Atlanta area last year. Medicaid and Medicare turn 58 years old this weekend. GPB's Donald Lowry reports here in Georgia, the programs remain as politically polarizing as ever. According to the National Archives, in July 1965, debates over health coverage dominated politics, leading President Lyndon B. Johnson to sign Medicaid and Medicare into law. Today, Georgia remains one of 10 states that hasn't fully expanded Medicaid, and that angers state Democrats like Senate Minority Leader Gloria Butler. It would provide health coverage for nearly 450,000 Georgians, not to mention create thousands of jobs and help struggling hospitals. While Governor Brian Kemp agrees more Georgians need health insurance, he contends full Medicaid expansion would become too costly and restrictive long term. This month he instituted an alternative program that insures more people but has a work requirement. Donna Lowry for GPB News. The Georgia Lottery announced yesterday that it raised more than one and a half billion dollars for education during the fiscal year that ended in June. It's the eighth consecutive year the lottery surpassed the billion-dollar mark in profits for education. The Macon Film Festival announced this week their inaugural Georgia Film Impact Award will go to Dallas Austin. The Grammy Award winner, film and music producer, and Columbus native is behind films like ATL and Drumline. The film festival will host a special screening of Drumline at the Grand Opera House on August 19th at 7.15 p.m. The film festival runs from August 17th through the 20th. And that's it for today's edition of Georgia Today. I'd like to remind you that many of the stories that you hear on this podcast are available on our website, gpb.org slash news. The website also has lots of stories that aren't on the podcast, stories that are just for the written word, so check out gpb.org slash news. Send us your feedback about Georgia Today to georgiatoday at gpb.org and hit subscribe on this podcast so you always stay current with us in your feed. I'm Orlando Montoya. It's been a fun seven days filling in for Peter Biello, who is off on a well-deserved vacation. He'll be back next week. In the meantime, you have a great weekend.